Okay? Now, the next thing is this. After I, I receive a signal, I actually have to send a secondary signal into the cell to activate the behavior of the cell. So in this case, I'm going to use a channel, which is like an olive. And what happens is this. This protein moves around through the membrane. See, it's closed at the top. Nothing can get through. But when it opens, it makes a channel where signal molecules can shoot inside the cell. And the bottom line is this. The only thing that can go through this channel is what fits. If the molecule doesn't fit, it doesn't go through the channel. So basically it says this, in the resting state, the protein is closed. But when activated, the protein opens, and when it opens, it allows signals to go into the cell and coordinate the behavior of the cell. So now that we've looked at that, let's put the two together and then show you what is this, this mechanism that controls biology. The two together, the input and the output. This is looking for the environmental signal, and this is going to convert that signal into behavior. This is the connector. Look at the shape. Does it fit here, yes or no? Okay, so that means no signal is present. So nothing's, no behavior. But when the signal shows up, I change the shape. When the shape is changed, then I connect it, open this one up, and see this? This is the signal that tells the cell to do something, and it's going to do whatever is connected to that. So the bottom line is the behavior of the cell is controlled by the input of the environment and then the conversion of that input into a behavior signal that coordinates the function of the cell to respond to what's going on in the environment. Interesting point. If I cut the antenna off the cell so it cannot see anything, there's no behavior. The cell is totally comatose. It'll sit there, and what does that mean? It says then behavior is related to the signal. If there's no signal, there's no behavior. So it's like reflex, stimulus, response. The, the signal is the stimulus, and then the cell creates a response. So basically it goes like this. The receptor is the input. It reads the environment. The receptor then connects to the effector, which generates the behavior through a secondary signal. The primary signal, this is the secondary signal that activates the behavior of the cell. So that this unit is controlling a specific aspect of behavior. But there's like thousands of these different kinds of units simultaneously. So this is an example of just a switch. It's a switch. When insulin shows up, switch on metabolism. When histamine shows up, switch on protection. So there's each, for each different thing that's out in the environment, there's a switch that will activate the behavior of the cell. So basically, did, did you understand that as a switch, input-output? Well, then look at it this way. The function of the receptor is awareness of the environment, right? It sees. But I have to convert that signal into a biological action. So the function of the output guy, the effector, is to create a physical sensation or response to that signal. Is that understandable so far? Why is this important? Go back and ask the first step is this. What does this do? What does it do? It controls a typical behavior in response to the signal. Well, what is this called? Well, it represents awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So what is this control unit actually called? Perception. Perception, awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So if I go back a second, I say, what is the function of this? And the answer is this. It's perception. It sees the environment and activates a behavior. There's no DNA involved. There's no genes involved. All we're talking about is stimulus response. Stimulus comes in the receptor, response made by the effector. Okay? So the point about it is this simple first conclusion. It's very basic. Behavior, which is movement, this is behavior. <laughs> movement of protein is controlled by the signal, but via perception. So the bottom line is this. Perception controls behavior. If there is no perception, there's no behavior. And all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, well that's number one. We didn't have genes involved yet. So let's just see how this actually works. So basically, here are proteins in the cell. Let's say that these proteins carry out a specific function, respiration or digestion. We call it a pathway. So let's say it's a muscle contraction. That these proteins, when activated, what, will, what activates the protein? The signal activates the protein. So what we're going to do is convert an environmental signal using the receptor and the effector. And this time I'm using an enzyme. Okay? And what I'm going to show you is how the mechanism from the environment, the signal, well, here's my connector one. Remember the green guy? 
But now the signal comes, and when the signal from the environment binds to the receptor, it changes the shape or confirmation of the receptor, which implies that the signal is there. So the protein informs the cell that something has happened. Now that that shape has changed, this processor protein, the green one, can bind to the shape because it wasn't able to bind before. It wasn't the right shape. It's like dominoes, one hitting the next. Now that the processor protein is bound to the receptor, it changes its shape and will conform to fit the, en the enzyme. So one domino hits the next, hits the next. Now that this is connected, I activate the enzyme, and the enzyme is going to create a signal. Now, here's, here's the connection between my muscle of the proteins and the receptor. This is the secondary signal. Remember, primary signal and secondary signal. Well, at first, it's bound and covered up and inhibited because if there's no signal, I don't want it to do anything. But when the signal shows up, then I take the enzyme, split it, and the active component, now this is the active signal, can bind to the protein. And now I can activate this protein. And this is the behavior that's going to be expressed by the cell. And the question, of course, is, well, what really activated this protein? What was the original source? The answer is the primary signal at the environment was then relayed by the secondary signal to activate the behavior of the cell. So without all the labels, if we just quickly look at it, uh, let's just go right through it real fast. And the point about it is this. Uh, let's see. That uh, here's the environmental signal. Here's the, the receptor, the effector. That's the perception unit. Perception is now being started because it saw the environment, changed the shape, activates the enzyme. The enzyme is activated, breaks that molecule, the signal molecule. The signal molecule comes down, binds to the protein, and generates behavior. The bottom line was this. The behavior of the cell is not programmed. The behavior of the cell is continuously adjusting to whatever the signals are in the environment. So now I've got another question to ask you. What happens if that environmental signal shows up, but I don't have the proteins necessary in the cell right now for that event? So when it shows up, it says, oh, I can't make a response. I don't have the behavioral proteins. Where do we get the behavioral proteins? Now we bring the DNA back in. What's the role of the DNA? The DNA double helix actually is a blueprint of the protein. If I separate the helix into, each, into two separate strands, and you look at the, these, these are called bases, these are the steps of the double helix right here, the color sequence in the DNA codes for the sequence of the amino acids. So for every three bases, I can tell you which is the next amino acid. So the point is this. The plan of how to make a protein, a specific protein, is built into this DNA. So that every three bases say, oh, put in tryptamine. Okay, put in proline. Next one, put in alanine, whatever it is. So the sequence, the DNA is a blueprint for the protein. Okay? That's all it is. It doesn't have any action except when I need it. So how do I activate the gene? Well, this is, you heard of cancer genes? And you say, what is that, a gene that gives you cancer? And the answer is, here's a simple truth. Genes do not self-activate. That's biochemically a truth, meaning a gene cannot turn itself on and a gene cannot turn itself off. If you want a gene to be active, it's not up to the gene. So the concept that there's a cancer gene is a false concept, meaning this. If the gene really caused cancer and you were in possession of that gene, when would you express the cancer? You would express it by the time you were born because as soon as the cells started to divide, the cancer gene would say, okay, time to make cancer. So how can you have so-called cancer gene for 30 or 40 years sitting in your body and you don't have cancer and then you get cancer? Should I go back and say the gene caused that? And the answer is no. In this paper by Niehaut, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, he, play, he played it out in this true, truth, a simple statement of truth that I'm going to show you because I want to use his paper because the statement is so perfect. But the fact is this. What did he say? He said this. For 50 years, we have believed that genes are in control. We've been repeating it and saying it over and over again for 50 years so that it's part of every textbook. And the bottom line was, that was never a scientific reality. It was never scientifically established that genes control anything. It's not true. What is the truth? Well, the answer is this. The first thing, conventional belief, genes control biology, is totally false. Why? 
Genes can't turn themselves on. Genes can't turn themselves off. How are they going to control anything? They can't control themselves. So bottom line is the genes aren't in charge. So the question is, if I need a gene to 